رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I welcome you all to our madrasa course and today inshallah we will be doing chapter 13 of book 4 and today's chapter is about as you can see in the picture it's about Hajj Hajj and Eid al -Adha. Hajj is the pilgrimage to the Kaaba in Mecca. It is the fifth pillar of Islam. So Hajj is a pillar of Islam and it is compulsory on people um, uh, on who uh, on people on Muslims who can afford going to Hajj and uh, there is nothing dangerous in their journey as well as uh, the other condition is that they have left enough for their uh, family back home. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حِجُّ الْبَيْتِ مَنِ اسْتَطَعَ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا Hajj to the house is a duty to Allah for mankind. For him, who can find a way to do it? The main purpose of the Hajj is to show obedience to Allah. The Hajj is a way of worshipping Allah. It is the duty of each Muslim to go for Hajj at least once in their lifetime as long as they can find a way to it and the family left behind is properly provided for if if a muslim has enough money and can afford going to hajj and uh, the journey to hajj from his place is not dangerous and uh, the family left behind is uh, properly taken care of in his absence or in her absence uh, then it is a duty on a muslim to go on hajj Hajj is a physical uh, duty to Allah. Uh, in the center of the Grand Mosque, that is Al-Masjid Al-Haram. So there uh, in, in Mecca, this, this is uh, the Masjid Al-Haram, the Grand Mosque. And in this, there is a beautifully, a very attractive, amazingly beautiful building known as the Kaaba the house of Allah. This was built by Prophet Ibrahim salam, and his son Ismail salam. It was the first place for the worship of Allah on earth. We face the Kaaba in Mecca in our prayers five times a day. So this is nothing but the Qibla. Okay, then we come to how we begin with Hajj. So first thing is the Ihram. Um, most people believe that Ihram are uh, the clothes, uh, that is uh, two white clothes worn by the men. Uh, um, and for women, it's, it's their ordinary uh, uh, clothes, but um, everything, every part of the body should be covered except for the face and the uh, hands uh, that is the palms uh, so this will be the ihram that's what they think but actually ihram is the intention to perform hajj or umrah and those clothing are nothing but the ihram clothing so ihram is actually the intention to perform hajj or umrah hajj is called as the major pilgrimage and umrah the minor pilgrimage before entering makkah each pilgrim takes a bath and puts on a special dress for ihram. For men, the ihram clothing consists of two unstitched pieces of cloth to cover the upper and lower parts of their body. And women wear clothes which cover everything except their faces and hands. In fact, Ihram clothing for ladies consists of their simple daily clothes. They are required to keep their faces and hands uncovered while in the state of Ihram. 
so for men and women it's different for men it is two unstitched clothes and for women it's uh, their uh, regular simple clothes uh, except that they shouldn't be covering their faces and hands and everything else should be covered as all the pilgrims dress alike many differences between them vanish so uh, as uh, as you can just see in the the picture and uh, you might have seen uh, uh, the channels the saudi channels as well they they telecast the uh, hajj every year so and even the uh, umrah uh, that they telecast every uh, day uh, the pilgrims, most of uh, uh, them, I mean, almost all of them, the pilgrims are uh, in same dresses. And uh, so uh, we can just see, I think, a sea of um, people in white uh, and sometimes black, that is the woman wearing the abaya. But as the pilgrims, all of the pilgrims are dressed alike. And between them, there are no differences at all. They are all equal. During the Hajj, pilgrims must not cut their hair. So there are some um, <clears throat> do's and don'ts once we are in Ihram. So they cannot cut their hair. They cannot wear perfume or hunt or harm any uh, living thing in any way while in the state of Ihram. They must make efforts not to get angry with others. So uh, it is a place where hundreds and thousands of people gather for Hajj. And uh, there are different types of people. Uh, there are a huge crowd. There is a huge crowd. And yes, it, uh, uh, everyone do not get to stay in the comfort zone. So, uh, yes, it's easy to get angry. So that is why uh, this is also um, uh, mentioned here that they should try their best not to get angry. So the Arabic term Miqat means the place around Makkah from which a pilgrim assumes the state of Ihram. So there is a boundary um, around uh, Makkah. Uh, and uh, any any uh, person uh, crossing that boundary uh, should be a pilgrim and they have to be in the state of ihram. The pilgrim changes into ihram clothing at the Mikat and pronounces his intention to perform hajj or umrah. Uh, they can be wearing that uh, ihram clothing much before reaching Mikat. Some of them... Um, wear the clothing even at the airport uh, so that's that's completely fine uh, but as soon as they reach the mikat they have to be in ihram clothing and they will announce uh, or pronounce their intention to perform hajj or umrah again and uh, then they would begin the uh, talbiya as well for uh, people living inside the mikat permanently like the residences uh, nearby uh, the Masjid al-Haram or uh, inside that boundary that is the Mikat. They live there. That is their uh, usual place. Uh, they live there permanently as residences. So uh, that place or that place itself uh, is their Mikat. So for such people, the Mikat is their own place. So once the pilgrim assumes the state of ihram, he becomes a muhrim. He offers two rakahs and pronounces his intention to perform hajj or umrah as the case may be. He then starts reciting the talbiyah loudly and frequently and continues to do so until he arrives at the masjid al-haram. Women recite the talbiyah silently. And what is this talbiyah? It is to uh, say... Labbaik Allahumma labbaik. Labbaik la sharika laka labbaik. Inna alhamda wa ni'amata laka wal mulk la sharika lak. So the meaning of this is Labbaik, I am present or I am at your service, O Lord. Uh, and uh, you have no partners. Uh, and uh, 
all praise and all blessings belong to you alone, O Allah. So that is labbaik. La sharika laka labbaik. Inna alhamda wa ni'amata laka wal mulk. La sharika laka. So, uh, women recite it silently. Okay, so the ihram, uh, we have got into the ihram, state of ihram. And then we have also crossed mikat. And now we have arrived at um, uh, Makkah. And uh, from there, uh, we would be traveling towards Masjid al-Haram. Uh, when uh, we were uh, doing our first umrah, uh, I was constantly looking out for Kaaba. Uh, from the time we left the airport of uh, uh, the, I think we went to uh, Riyadh, prob probably the, uh, the the airport of Riyadh. From there, we had to travel by uh, a taxi, uh, and from there, uh, it was a continuous hunting or searching for uh, Masjid Al Haram and looking out for Kaaba, but. Believe me, you will not be able to see any, uh, even a glimpse of it. So, uh, until you reach the um, Masjid Al Haram and enter it, so there are mountains covering it, there are lots of buildings covering it. So, once you enter the Masjid Al Haram and uh, you enter, and that is when you will be able to see the Kaaba. And it is amazingly beautiful. It is very, very attractive. So now the first thing to do after seeing the Kaaba, uh, many people, uh, they uh, get very emotional. Uh, they need some time. They, they, they ask for forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They, they seek for a lot of forgiveness. They seek for a lot of uh, things that they want. They make a lot of dua. And uh, that is their personal time with their Lord. And then uh, uh, what they have to do is to perform tawaf. And that is to walk around the Kaaba saying prayers seven times. So this going around of the Kaaba would be in the anti-clockwise. And uh, uh, this act is called as the tawaf. And there, there would be uh, seven uh, rounds that you have to uh, complete. So that would uh, begin. Um, uh, there is a starting point for that. And when you again reach that starting point, that would complete uh, the first circle. Uh, or the circumambulation of uh, uh, Kaaba is called as the Tawaf. As each person gets to the black stone, he touches or kisses it while saying Allahu Akbar just as Allah's Messenger وسلم, did. Pilgrims who are too far away to do so raise their hands in this direction and say Allahu Akbar. So as you are uh, circling around the Kaaba, there is one of the uh, corners which has the Hajri Aswad. That is the black stone. It is the stone from Jannah and Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He used to touch it. He used to kiss it and uh, say Allahu Akbar uh, every time he passed uh, by it. So even the pilgrims are supposed to do so. Um, but most of the time it's it's too crowded near Hajj Aswad and uh, not all can reach that. So pilgrims who are far away, for them, they can just raise their hands towards uh, Hajj Aswad and say Allah Akbar. So that would uh, suffice. And uh, women and children, they, they have to be especially careful uh, because there is no control over the crowd over there. So uh, please make sure that you are safe. And it's very important to keep yourself safe, uh, not to get yourself touched or not to get yourself uh, unhurt, yourself uh, hurt uh, while doing this. And it's, it's, it's really uh, good to uh, just stay away from that crowd and just raise your hands towards its direction and say, Allah Akbar. 
So that would complete the tawaf. After performing the tawaf, pilgrims run or walk at a pace between two hillocks near the Kaaba called Safa and Marwa. This act is called Sa'i. It reminds Muslims of the time Ismail and his mother Hajar had been left in the desert by Prophet Ibrahim salam, at Allah's command. So we all are uh, aware of the story behind this, uh, the Zamzam. And uh, Ismail was at that time a small uh, baby. And uh, Hajar uh, uh, took Prophet, uh, um, sorry, Prophet Ibrahim took Hajar and Ismail and uh, left them in that uh, desert. Uh, and uh, when their stock of water ran out and the child was very thirsty, uh, the mother Hajar ran frantically between these two hillocks in search of water. So sometimes she used to uh, run towards the Safa and then come back and uh, see if the baby was fine and then run towards the other direction towards Marwa and again come back and see if the baby was fine. So uh, this was her uh, act. So uh, returning to Ismail, she found that after having those seven rounds, when she returned back to Ismail, she found that a spring of water had gushed forth near him. So the spring called Zamzam is now found underground beneath the courtyard of the Kaaba. Pilgrims go to drink some of the water before beginning the sign. So the story behind Sai is this. And uh, I just was reminded of the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he mentioned that it was uh, Hajra uh, who was uh, continuously uh, saying stop, stop to the gushing water out. And he mentioned if she wouldn't have done so, uh, then the whole earth would be filled with Zamzam. So this is a hadith related to that. And after the sai, there is halak, having the head shaven or taksir having a haircut follows. So first is tawaf. Um, then we have the sai. Uh, so between the tawaf and sai, uh, people also uh, pray two rakahs behind the maqam Ibrahim. So then we do the sai and after the sai there is uh, shaving of head or cutting of hair. Uh, for men uh, it is highly recommended they, they get their heads shaven. Uh, for women it's to cut their hair about an inch. So pilgrims now shower and change into everyday clothes depending on the type of hajj they perform. So once they finish the tawaf, uh, recite, I mean praying two rakas of, uh, uh, two rakas behind the uh, maqam Ibrahim and then sai and then halak or taksir is done. After these four things, the, uh, the uh, Umrah is complete. The minor pilgrimage is complete. And if a person has gone with the intention of Umrah, they can now uh, come out of Ihram. So once they have done their halak and taksir, uh, they can come out of uh, the state of Ihram and uh, their life will be like any other uh, normal person now. But if a person is uh, uh, gone with the intention of Hajj, uh, there are different types of Hajj and depending on the type of Hajj, this can be done. So we'll be learning more about the types of Hajj in our future classes. This completes the pilgrim's Umrah. All restrictions of the Ihram are now temporarily lifted from the pilgrim. He will now wait for the 8th of Zul Hijjah to start the other rites of Hajj. So there are many people who go for Hajj and they uh, go uh, many days before the actual Hajj, which is performed on the 8th, 9th and 10th of Zul Hijjah. So uh, after the Umrah, they can just uh, relax. So when, uh, when it is the 8th of Zul Hijjah, 
what is going to happen. The rites of Hajj begin. On the 8th of Zul Hijjah, most pilgrims pronounce a new niya at their place of precedence to perform Hajj. There is no need for them to go to the Miqat for this reason. So now once they have already crossed the Miqat, uh, that uh, and they have performed the Umrah. Now they are uh, outside the state of Ihram. But on the 8th of Zul Hijjah, uh, the place of their residence itself, they are entering into Ihram again. The pilgrims change into Ihram clothing and proceed to Mina soon after the Fajr prayer. On the eighth day of Zul Hijjah, the first day of Hajj, Muslims travel to Mina, about eight kilometers from Makkah. Here they spend the night. So Mina is about eight kilometers away from Makkah, and there the Muslims travel and they spend the night there. That is all that they do on the eighth of Zul Hijjah. The next day, the ninth of Zul Hijjah, they travel to the plain of Arafat, about twenty-two kilometers from Makkah. They halt for the day in this plain and pray to Allah. They ask his forgiveness. It is a moving experience to join together with as many as 3 million other pilgrims in the same place for one purpose, that is to worship Allah. You all might have uh, seen uh, the, the day of Arafat, which is being telecasted uh, on the Saudi Arab channels. So uh, each and every pilgrim will be present on the day of Arafat in that plain of Arafat and they would be worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they would be asking for his forgiveness. This gathering reminds the pilgrims of the day when everyone will be brought before Allah for judgment. So this would be the case even on the day of judgment. It is a reminder to us that we will be gathered in the similar manner and it will be really very crowded even on the day of judgment. Uh, this is for the pilgrims. Here I would like to include that those who are not pilgrims and at and are at their homes, uh, it is a very good sunnah to fast on this day. That is the day of Arafat. Okay. Then after the worship is done at sunset, the pilgrims travel to Muzdalifa. So how many places have we learned till now? We have learned about Mina, where they stay overnight. Then we have learned about Arafat. You can just see this is uh, the place of Arafat properly. Uh, it is sunset. It's the time of sunset. And the pilgrims are again moving back to, uh, moving back from Arafat to Muzdalifa. This is a bare rocky place back in the direction of Makkah, midway between Arafah and Mina. The pilgrims spend the night there. They combine the Maghrib and Isha prayers together and shorten the Isha prayer to two rakahs. They also offer the Fajr prayer there and collect pebbles ready for the next day when they reach Mina. So this is what Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did and uh, uh, this is incumbent. The same worship is incumbent for on every uh, Muslim, on every pilgrim. So what they do is at sunset time, uh, they move away from Arafat and they go towards Mustalifa. They will have to spend their night there. So their Maghrib and Isha prayers are combined and shortened. They also pray their Fajr prayers. They also collect pebbles from Muzdalifa. Then they again on uh, the 10th, that is uh, 8th, we had been in, in Mina. 9th, we have been in Arafat and uh, Muzdalifa. And now on the 10th, from Muzdalifa, we go back to Mina. So at Mina, there are three stone pillars called Jamrat. 
the jamrat are located within a few hundred feet of one another in a line. They remind Muslims that it was here that shaitan hopelessly tried to tempt Ibrahim salam not to perform the sacrifice Allah wanted. Pilgrims pelt the Aqaba pillar with the pebbles they have already collected from Muzdalifa. The symbolic action shows that it was not only Ibrahim and Ismail salam who had to reject shaitan. Everyone has to struggle against evil. So there at Mina, the, the stoning uh, with the help of pebbles happens. And uh, this is again an act of Ibrahim alayhi salam, where he was um, uh, tempted by the uh, shaitan not to uh, perform the sacrifice Allah wanted him to do. So after stoning the Jamrat, many pilgrims sacrifice an animal in memory of Prophet Ibrahim's sacrifice of a sheep instead of his son Ismail. They now have a haircut and have their heads shaven and proceed to Makkah to perform Tawaf al-Ifada and then the Sa'i if they have not performed Sa'i after performing Tawaf al-Qudum. So all these things, inshallah, different types of uh, hajj, different types of uh, tawaf, we will be learning more about it. So once they are done with the pelting of uh, uh, um, the jamarat, uh, they uh, move back to uh, Makkah. They perform the, uh, they get their halak done and they perform the tawaf and sai. Pilgrims stay in Mina for another two or three days to pray, stone the Jamarat pillars and remember Allah. They return to Makkah for Tawaf of the Kaaba again. At the end of the Hajj, large number of pilgrims go to Medina to visit the Prophet's mosque Al-Masjid Al-Nabwi. So the Hajj is now complete with uh, uh, the final uh, Tawaf and uh, then the pilgrims are out of their uh, Ihram once the sacrifice is also done and then they are free to go and visit uh, places. Uh, most For most of the Muslims it's once in a lifetime opportunity so they visit uh, other places as well. Uh, and uh, they never forget to visit Prophet's mosques that, uh, mosque that is in Medina, that is Al-Masjid Al-Nabawi. Everyone would uh, like to visit Medina. Now, um, Eid Al-Adha, the rest of the world uh, uh, is celebrating Eid Al-Adha, that is the festival of sacrifice. Uh, one night, Prophet Ibrahim salam had a dream. He saw that uh, he sacrificed his son Ismail alayhi salam. Ibrahim was a truthful prophet. His dream was a true dream. Ibrahim alayhi salam decided to do what Allah had commanded him to do in the dream. Ibrahim alayhi salam asked Ismail alayhi salam, my son, I saw in a dream that I must sacrifice you. What do you think about this? To this Ismail alayhi salam replied, do as you are ordered. Allah willing, you will find me resolute. So this we all are aware of how Ibrahim alayhi salam was tested. Actually, uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam was childless for a very long time. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with a son, Ismail. And when the son was about 12 or 13, that is when Ibrahim alayhi salam got this true dream. And uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam being a true uh, uh, believer in Islam, a true, a uh, very, uh, 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 what do we say, a very good slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wanted to do what Allah had commanded him. So when he shared his dream with his son, his son Ismail alayhi salam also replied in affirmative. He said that Allah willing, inshallah, you will find me resolute. You will find me steadfast. When Ibrahim alayhi salam reached Mina, 
he made ready for the sacrifice of Ismail alayhi salam. Ismail laid down on the ground and Ibrahim alayhi salam put the knife to Ismail's throat. By doing this, Ibrahim alayhi salam showed that he loved Allah more than his son. When Ibrahim alayhi salam had passed the test, Allah sent Jibrail alayhi salam with a ram to spare Ismail's life. So, um, Ibrahim was shown in the dream that he would be in this position, that he would put the knife to Ismail's throat. And even in real life that happened, Ibrahim got ready and he put the knife to Ismail's throat. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, replaced Ismail with a ram. And Ismail was saved. Allah was very, very pleased because Ibrahim alayhi salam had passed his test. So he commanded the Muslims to make a sacrifice of an animal in remembrance of this incident. So that is what we do in Eid al-Adha when uh, from every family a sacrificial animal is given and uh, that is being divided. We will learn in this paragraph. Let's go ahead. Eid al-Adha comes on the 10th day of the month of Zul Hijjah. This is the festival of sacrifice which marks the end of the great time of Hajj. This mark, this, this is to say that the Hajj is complete. Eid al-Adha lasts for four days and is celebrated much in the same way as Eid al-Fitr with big congregational prayer, Salatul Eid, and exchange of gifts. Its special feature is the sacrifice of an animal in the memory of the story of Prophet Ibrahim salam, and his son Ismail. Salam. The purpose of this festival is to remind Muslims of their duty to submit to the will of Allah at all times. So this is what Ibrahim salam did. He submitted to the will of Allah and that is what all the Muslims have their duty towards Allah. The slaughtered animal then is divided into three portions. One is kept for the family itself. One is given to relatives, neighbors and friends. And the third is given to the poor and the needy for whom this may be the only time in the year that they eat meat. Eid al-Adha is a period of joy and remembrance of Allah. So that ends the chapter of Hajj and Eid al-Adha. Let's quickly finish the exercises. Ihram explain the terms. Ihram is the intention uh, to, to perform Hajj or Umrah. Second is Miqat. Uh, Miqat, we can say that it is a boundary around the um, uh, Masjid al Haram, uh, uh, much, much beyond that, actually, around Makkah. Uh, and uh, anyone passing through this boundary should be in the state of Ihram, should be a pilgrim. What is Tawaf? Tawaf is the circumambulation of the house of Allah, that is the Kaaba. And what is Sa'i? Sa'i is um, walking uh, between the two hills, Safa and Marwa. Uh, and let me include here uh, that uh, women are supposed to just walk slowly. Um, but for men, it is little different. The Sa'i is little different. For uh, men, there have been placed green lights and red lights uh, on that path between Safa and Marwa. And during the green lights, the men are supposed to uh, run something like jog between uh, on uh, between these two hills on the green light. So that is Sai for men. Halak is, um, is cutting or shaving. No, Halak is the shaving of head. Yes. And Taksir is cutting, haircut. And Jamarat, Jamarat are the uh, pillars in Mina um, uh, where the pelting uh, happens. Pelting with the help of stone happens, yes. Uh, B, what is the Mikat for the permanent resident of Makkah? Yes, uh, an important one. Um, Mikat for the permanent resident of Makkah is the very same place. Uh, their house or their uh, place of residence. Okay. 
Number C, rearrange the following words to indicate the procedure of Hajj. All right, so how will we rearrange these? Let me use an annotation. All right, so first one, what do we have? Yes, first one is Ihram. And second one, oh no, first is Mikat. We will be traveling through Mikat. Why isn't this staying? Okay. Um, okay, I will use text. So first one is Mikat. Then we have is it Mikat or Ihram? No, actually it is first is Ihram. And second one is... Mm, second is Mikat. And then we will be performing Tawaf. And... Um, then uh, after tawaf, we would be having um, sa'i, right? And what's next? After sa'i, what would we do? Halak, halak or taksir. That would be in the case of uh, umrah. But uh, in the case of hajj, this would be Okay, there are two things here, halak and taksir. Then we have the shaving of the head. So we would go with halak and taksir as five. Then this, this completes the umrah, the minor pilgrimage. Then on the 8th, 9th and 10th of Zulhijjah, that would again begin. We would again go back to uh, ihram. That is five. And this would be again... Six, we would go back to Ihram, and then from there we would be traveling to Mina, and uh, from there we would be traveling the next day to Arafat. Uh, after Arafat would be Muzdalifa. After Muzdalifa, uh, we would go and belt those Jamarat. That is ten, and then. Um, Yes, these two things. Shaving of head and sacrifice. I think first is sacrifice and then is shaving of head. So that would complete the Hajj. All right. So let's go ahead. Okay, that's not staying. No problem. So what is the special feature of Eid al-Adha? Um, it is uh, the sacrificing of animal on the Eid al-Adha uh, where uh, this would uh, indicate the act of Ibrahim alayhi salam and also marks the end of Hajj. How many portions is the sacrificed animal divided into? That's divided into three. One for self, one for uh, the neighbors and the relatives and the third one for the poor and the needy. Okay. So I think that's the end of the chapter. Jazakallah khair. Subhanakallahumma. Wa bihamdika nashadu ala ilaha ila anta nastaghfiraka wa natubu ilaika.